All right, party people. So it doesn't matter if your AR-15 is a poverty pony like this one or something a little more higher end like this one. There's always room for improvement or there's always something that you can upgrade on them just to make them a little bit better and to make them fit you as a shooter a little bit better as well. You know, over these past seven or eight years of owning AR-15s, I have tried a ton of different upgrades for my AR-15s. I've tried the stuff that people think is stupid, and I've tried stuff that people don't think is stupid. I've tried to whittle it down to things that make it worthwhile upgrading, things that actually matter in your AR-15. And in today's video, we're gonna be covering the top 13 or 14, I haven't decided yet, AR-15 upgrades that can be had for less than one Benjamin Franklin. So welcome back, party people. Hope you guys are doing awesome. So as we're going through the video today, if you see anything that you wanna pick up for yourself or find ways not to pay full price for it, I will include a parts list for everything that we're talking about in this video. To find that parts list, it's the very first link in the description, and I'll also pin it down in the comments section for you as well. So I don't wanna waste any time today, let's just jump into it. Now the first upgrade is probably the most exciting one because you can either buy it or you can do it for free. Now if you have a cheaper bolt carrier group or a bolt carrier group that doesn't have much of a reputation, you don't have to replace the entire bolt carrier group to get really good life out of it. You can replace just a couple of things and you will actually get a lot of life out of it and make it a lot more reliable as well. For example, two of the most common failure points on an AR-15 is going to be in the bolt carrier group. More specifically, your cam pin and your extractor. A lot of gunsmiths have noted that one of the things that wears out the cam pin the fastest is when you take it apart to clean it, you actually spin the cam pin in different directions every time you reassemble it. And that can cause premature breakage of the cam pin. One of the ways you can address that is to buy a new cam pin that has an indexing point on there. So that way, whenever you reassemble it, you always face that indexing point in the same exact direction. And then therefore you prolong the life of the cam pin in your bolt carrier group. However, there is a free way to do this. Simply get yourself a stinking punch and a hammer and mark the cam pin that you currently have. It's actually really easy to do. You just put the cam pin into a vise, whack it one or two good times and it's marked. And now you have an indexing point so you always know which direction to face it. This is something I'm started to do recently on all of my bolts, especially when they're new from the factory. By the way, if you could do me a quick favor and just hit the subscribe button and turn on all notifications. When you hit the subscribe button, it trips the algorithm to recommend these videos so that more people can see it. And if that's not enough reason to shove it in the face of anti-gunners, I don't know what is. Now, the second upgrade you could do to your current bolt carrier group, if you have a more affordable one, is you can simply buy a higher end bolt. There's a bunch of them that are available that are made of really good Carpenter 158 tool steel and have really good extractors on them. A couple off the top of my head, I know that Sons of Liberty Gunworks makes a really good bolt that's way less than $100. And then I know that Daniel Defense also makes a really good bolt that's less than $100. Now, if you find yourself that already having a really good bolt, but maybe you're having some extraction issues you can always upgrade the extractor with an extractor kit from BCM. They have really high powered springs and they just take a lot of care into making them stronger and more reliable. Those can be had for like 30 bucks or something like that. But honestly, like if you had a decent bolt carrier group and you just wanted to ensure the life of it, you can simply just do the cam pin and upgrade your extractors and the life of this thing will last a heck of a lot longer. Now, the next place to think about when you wanna do an upgrade on your AR-15, if you're still running a mil spec trigger and you love it, then fine, you don't need to worry about this. But a lot of us don't really care for the mil spec trigger, especially if you're a civilian and you're not on any type of duty use. I know a lot of duty weapons don't come with upgraded triggers just because of insurance purposes. I know that a lot of people say you can't buy skill set, and I totally agree with that. But changing the trigger will dramatically improve your shooting. Don't get me wrong, practicing your fundamentals is always important, so don't ever skip that. But if you already have good trigger discipline and good fundamentals, it just takes you to the next level. A couple of my favorite triggers that cost less than $100 are number one, the Palmetto State Armory drop-in trigger. It's not the best drop-in trigger ever, and it's not the worst. It pulls really good at about 3.5 pounds, and it's definitely the easiest to install of the triggers that we're gonna be talking about today. I've had one for over a year. I've ran it, and I've had zero issues with it, and I love, and it's heck of a lot nicer to shoot than mil spec. And those come in around the $99 mark. And so if you wanna go even cheaper, favorite trigger to get is the Hyperfire EDT triggers. They're essentially mil-spec plus triggers that pull it around the four and a half pound mark. They're not as light 
right as the PSA drop-in trigger, but the good thing about them is you can still shoot them really fast. Those typically cost around $30 to $40, just kind of depending on where you pick them up. I'll make sure to have links to them over at the parts list. But if you can't afford that and you want to go even cheaper, I highly recommend a set of JP Springs for your mil spec setup. The set of JP Springs will take your trigger pull from about six and a half, seven pounds down to about four and a half pounds very easily, and it's a very cost effective trigger upgrade. Now the next upgrade is usually the one that I change first whenever I pick up a new rifle if it doesn't come with the right one and that is going to be the grip. I change this out primarily because a lot of the guns that I get come with either the wrong angle of the grip or they come with the wrong texture or they come without the beaver tail. So if you're new to AR-15 grips they come in different angles different textures, and then some have a beaver tail, like this one from LWRC, and some don't. For me, I prefer one with a beaver tail, so it pushes my hand a little bit further back because you can see my index finger is already starting to touch the front of this trigger guard. Whereas you can see on this one, it doesn't have a beaver tail. And when it's this far forward, you can see how far past the trigger guard my finger sits. And sometimes when you're coming uh, from low ready and shooting, your finger will get caught on it. So you can choose to get a beaver tail or no beaver tail, and you can choose to get different textures and stuff like that. Currently, my favorite grip is the B5 Systems. I'll have a link over at the parts list. I don't remember the actual name of it, but I like the B5 Systems that has the beaver tail. They also make them without the beaver tail, as you can see on this guy. Um, they're only like 20 bucks, and they have really good grip texture, and they have the right angle for me. So when I'm shooting, I don't get my wrist tweaked in the wrong way. I can really hang on to it when I start sweating. You know yourself better than anyone, but I'll just rattle off some of my favorites and I'll have them over at the parts list for you. Favorite is the B5 Systems. Love it to death. It's affordable and you can't go wrong with it. Very similar to the B5 Systems, my next favorite is the Bravo Company Gunfighter Grip. This one actually has storage in it, whereas the B5 Systems doesn't. Um, but it's essentially the same thing. You can get these with or without the beaver tail. They have really good texturing and they have a really good angle on them. My next favorite is gonna be the Magpul K2s. Uh, they have the Mo and the Mo Plus. I think the Mo Plus is rubberized and the Mo isn't. I like them non-rubberized. I used to love the rubberized ones years ago, but over the years, as you shoot the rubberized grips, they become slippery because the oil from your hand soaks into the grip. So I used to love rubberized grips, not so much anymore. Which leads me to my next favorite grip, which is the Hogue grips. The Hogue grips are the most ergonomic grips ever, and it's like a hug for your hand, if that makes any sense. But the downside to most of them is they're made out of rubber, and over time, the oils of your hand seep into them and they just get slippery. Something else I like to swap out on most of my guns is the buttstock, especially if they come with those mil-spec buttstocks that like to rattle around a lot. Now, depending on what you're gonna use the gun for is gonna depend on what kind of buttstock you're gonna be getting. Now, if you're wanting something for long range shooting, you might wanna get something that's big and has the little levels on it and stuff like that so you can shoot long range. But for me, just for a standard do all purpose AR-15, I look for something that has a decent cheek weld. I look for something that has QD points on the rear of it right here. And I look for something that's easy for me to adjust and I'll look for something that's lightweight. One of my favorites is the B5 Systems Sop Mod stocks. Um, they're not the tightest lockup on them, but they do have a QD point in the back. They're very easy to extend and grab that latch that's right here, and they just feel really good and they're really lightweight. Now, probably my favorite stock of all time is the Bravo Company Gunfighter stock. This whole bottom section here is a compression so that you can extend it. It's not that easy to really crank in there and get it out, but I like about it, it's got a way better lockup than the B5 systems. It's also lightweight, and it also has QD points at the back as well as the little slits for your sling if you're running one. Now, one stock that I've really been geeking out on lately is I recently acquired an LWRC DI gun and their stock on here is incredibly tiny. And it's a little bit wobbly, but this thing is incredibly short. And something that I noticed about it is number one, it's probably the lightest weight stock that I own right now. Number two, it has that easy lock to move it backwards and forwards. Three, you still have the QD points. But what I noticed about this stock that makes it different from all the others that you just looked at is when this is in the fully closed position, it makes the overall length of this gun the same as some of my 13.9 and 14.5 pin and welded rifles, and this is a 16 inch rifle. I mean, look at that difference. The LWRC is a full 16 inch barrel with a flash hider, and the other one is my Blackout Defense, and I don't remember if it's 13.9 or 14.5, but it has a pin welded barrel. And that 
really impresses me. So I'm gonna look into these stocks a little bit more here in the near future, um, because I wanna try to take one of these and put it on some different guns and see how I feel about it. But first impressions of it so far are really good. Now, one of my next favorite stocks is the Magpul SL stocks. I like them because they're also small and lightweight. They don't rattle, they fit really snug. They also got the QD point. And the only gripe that I have about these is you can't just grab like this to pull it back. You have to grab on the sides. There's one on either side of this to pull it back like that. Now that's a pro and a con. If you're traveling around in military vehicles bouncing around, you don't want that button getting hit and getting pulled. Maybe that's a good thing for you. But for me, if a gun comes with it, I'm not worried about changing it. It's not my first pick, but it is a really good stock. Now let's talk about foregrips. I like two types of foregrips for me. This one here is a Magpul angled foregrip. It's made of polymer. I used to like metal foregrips back in the day, but I found as you start running the guns and getting them beat up a little bit, if a rock or something hits those metal foregrips and it causes them to gash, they're gonna cut you. So I've gone back to all polymer for my foregrips. Um, I like these angled ones because they're very ergonomic on your hands. You can wrap your finger around the front or you could put these against the wall and use them as a standoff when you're shooting. Um, I like these a lot, but sometimes if you don't grab them just right, your hand can slip back. And so my favorite one is this guy here. I think it's the BCM short vertical foregrip, but it has a slight angle to it. You flip it around like that. And what I like about it is when you're out shooting and you can really just pull this thing into you, you can also use it as a standoff, like against a wall or something like that. And you get zero slippage. This one just feels the most secure. They're only like 20 bucks or something like that. But I prefer these over the others, but I do like the angled ones as well. It just kind of depends on the gun and how I'm feeling that day. But for my purposes, they work great. But the biggest benefit to having any type of vertical foregrip or angled foregrip grip is they give you just a much more stable shooting platform so that you're faster and more accurate. Now let's talk about bolt catches. There seems to be a lot of debate about bolt catches on the internet. So the way I stand on bolt catches, I usually don't worry about upgrading it. I'll just use the mil spec bolt catch. It's not a big deal. I know how to use it. It's fine. If the gun comes with a better one, that's even better. However, a lot of people tend to like the Magpul bad levers. There's also um, a similar one from a company called Phase 5 Tactical. Personally for me, I have a bad lever, I just don't know where it is, otherwise I'd show it to you. I don't like them. I don't like something else in my trigger guard. And the way that they're manipulated is you kind of push it to release the bolt and you pull it up with your finger to lock the bolt. And I showed you earlier how my index finger is already extends pretty far across here. And so I found myself when I was coming in to get the trigger, I just kept hitting the bad lever. And so therefore I took it off and I don't use them anymore but a lot of people do like them. I just don't happen to be one of those peoples that can run really good with them. And the other downside about them is they don't really provide much benefit for left-handed shooters. They mainly just make doing reloads for a right-handed shooter a lot easier. However, recently I've been playing with two ambidextrous guns. One of them is this guy from X2 Development Group. I'll have a review coming out on this one in the near future. This one has ambi bolt lock as well as bolt release. The LWRC also ambi bolt lock and ambi bolt release. And then I got a couple of other guns that have bolt release only. One of the reasons why you don't see bolt lock and release on a lot of guns that are affordable is because there's a patent on it and only certain companies have enough money to spend to license that patent, which is why their guns cost more. However, there is a very affordable solution if you want a complete bolt, lock, and release on your non-ambidextrous lower. And that's called the PDQ bolt release. Now the downside to this one is you either need to pay someone to install it for you or you need to know what you're doing with a Dremel and a file in order to install it, but they're only like 50 bucks and it will completely transform your lower into a fully ambi bolt, lock, and bolt release. But I will say this, if you can swing it on getting a fully ambi gun, it does make the biggest difference in the world and let me show you why. Now, moving on to another touch point, this is another area of the gun that I always tend to upgrade if the rifle doesn't already include it, and that's gonna be an ambidextrous safety selector that I can change to be either 90 degrees or 45 degrees. Now, for years, I never upgraded my safeties, really. I tried one from Strike Industries in like 2017, and I didn't like it, and so I just didn't even worry about it. However, 
I got a gun a few years ago from Facts and Firearms and it came with the Radiant ambidextrous safety selectors on it. And after I shot it, I realized what I was missing. Now, with that said, there are a couple of things you really need to be mindful of when you're choosing an ambidextrous safety because that'll be the difference between you having a good experience and a not so good experience in regards to how easy and fun it is to shoot with. Number one, you want the offhand side of the safety to always be a little bit shorter than the primary hand side. And you want to be able to reverse those in case you're left-handed. The second thing is you want to have no interference of that safety hitting your trigger finger. I recently did a review on a Daniel Defense rifle, I believe the DDM4 version seven, a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't like their safeties because although it was ambidextrous, they were the same length. And I ended up having to remove one of the sides in order to just be able to come up and shoot it, you know, like so. And so what I like about these guys right here is number one, when they're 45 degrees and ambidextrous, not only can you just come up real fast, pull the trigger and defeat the safety at the exact same time. But when you go to re-engage the safety on a lot of the 90 degree safeties, if you look at this footage here, when I'm finished shooting, I have to pull my hand up all the way like this in order to re-engage the safety. Whereas with an ambi safety, I can simply be bang, bang, bang. I could just pull up my index finger and I'm on safe again. It's just less movement and it's just a lot easier and faster to shoot with. Currently, my two favorite ambidextrous safeties are gonna be the ones from Radian and the ones from Blackout Defense. Both of them, I would say, are about equal to one another, and both of them are around the same price. However, the Blackout Defense, you can get in more colors than you can for the Radian, so that's always fun. And speaking of Radian and Blackout Defense, the next part that I typically upgrade if the gun needs it is a larger ambidextrous charging handle. And the primary reason for that is optics. There's nothing wrong with these basic charging handles. They do their job and they do their job very effectively. However, when you start putting optics on guns, especially scopes, and if they don't have the best eye relief, you have to scoot them back a little bit, you'll find yourself searching for these charging handles when you're trying to you know, charge it. And sometimes you hit your knuckles on the scope or on the throw lever, whatever the case is. And so that's why I always prefer a bigger ambidextrous charging handle. Currently, I have three favorites. The first favorite is Radian. I mean, they're well known for their ambidextrous charging handles. I like them a lot and I've never had one fail on me or anything like that. My second favorite is also from Blackout Defense. It's definitely worth the money. It's less than a hundred bucks. I forget exactly what the price is. I think they're close to a hundred, but man, you get really robust handles. It's got really robust pins in there because tiny roll pins on these mil spec versions are a very common failure point. So having robust pins is something else important. However, there is another charging handle that I've recently started using and I'm kind of digging it. This one is called the Jackal from X2 Dev Group. I have one on the X2 Dev gun that I have right here. And then I have one on a build that I'm doing in a video series that we have coming in the near future. Now the X2 Dev Group version is different than both the Radian and different from the Blackout Defense. And that's gonna be based on where the hinge points is. Essentially what X2 Dev Group noticed, if any of these other charging handles get caught on gear or straps or they hit a ledge, it can unlock the bolt. So they put the hinge on the outside of the charging handle instead of on the inside. And what this does is it allows the charging handle, if it gets hit with something, not to budge. But if you want to disable it, you just put your hand in there and pull it back and you're good to go. Thought that was very fascinating. I don't have a lot of experience with these charging handles yet. It's just something I just started playing with. And so I thought I'd mention it to you guys, but I will include links to all of these over at the parts list for you. Now let's talk about muzzle devices. Now muzzle devices, tons of people are gonna have different opinions about these. I tend to go this route. If I want to use a flash hider, I'm typically gonna reach for some kind of three prong flash hider. I like these a lot better than your standard A2 bird cages for a couple of different reasons. Um, number one, they do a really good job at suppressing flash. The second reason that I like these is they actually do a really good job at reducing muzzle rise and eliminating a little bit of recoil. And not that AR-15s have a lot of recoil, but a jerky gun is not as fun to shoot as a flat gun. And so because of that, if I'm gonna run a flash hider, I always go for some kind of three prong. And honestly, I'm not really particular about the brand. However, I am starting to unify most of my muzzle devices to accept chemo. Although I don't have suppressors yet, that's a whole nother story. I just don't like paying for something that 
should be legal in the first place. It's it's a long story. We'll, we'll get into that later. But in the future, I'm gonna get suppressors. Um, so I want everything to have a quick QD mount for the suppressors. My next favorite is gonna be the VG6 Gamma, which I actually don't have on a gun right now. I had it on another gun that I was reviewing years ago, and then I took it off to review something else on it. I had them on a 308 AR-10 that I have, and that made my 308 shoot incredibly flat. And for a standard 223 5.56, they shoot really, really flat as well. My next favorite muzzle brake, I would say that costs less than $100, and if you finagle it right with codes, you can get them for less than 100, is the Lantac Dragon. Love that thing to death. It shoots flat as a pancake every single time. Now, with that said, one of the downside to muzzle brakes is you're gonna get blast out to the side, and if you're shooting indoors, or if you're feeling the concussive forces yourself, you need to do something with those. And so that's where blast mitigation devices come in. There's a couple of different blast, universal blast mitigation devices that you could choose from. One that I've always used from seven years or so is this guy from Indian Creek Design. Essentially, it comes with a piece that goes behind your muzzle brake that allows you to thread this on and thread it off. If your muzzle brake's longer than two inches, it might not work, but it does work very, very well. Forgot what the price is, but they're really cheap. The next one that I've been testing for about a year or so is this guy from Strike Industries. Um, it's the same thing. They come with like a tri-lug type adapter. It also goes behind your muzzle brake when you're installing it. And then this guy just clicks on and turns. But both of these are under hundred bucks. And I will say, if you're gonna run a muzzle brake, you need some kind of blast redirection device for indoor ranges. Now this next upgrade isn't really an upgrade, but I think you're gonna like it because it's super cheap. And that's gonna be this stuff. This is white lithium grease. I'll make sure to have a link for this over at the parts list, but I use this on every single gun in the buffer tube. This makes your charging the gun a lot smoother and it also quiets the spring down a little bit as well. Here's an example of a gun that has a very loud buffer tube and buffer spring. Listen. This gun has never been fired as of yet. Listen. That's without a break in. It's never been fired either. All I did was grease up the spring and the buffer. I think you can tell the difference between that and that. I know that a lot of people like to get the JP silent capture springs and stuff like that. I honestly have never tested them. I hope that I will in the future, but I don't believe that those are less than hundred bucks. So it wouldn't even pertain to today's video anyway. Now for these next few upgrades, these aren't really upgrades that you do to the gun. They're things that you add to the gun. The first one's gonna be lights. For sub $100 rifle lights, I'm just gonna stick to one because it's my all time favorite. And it's, I think it's very difficult to beat for the price. You can find these for less than hundred bucks sometimes. Most of the time they're about 120, 130, but because they can be had for less, we're gonna include it. And that's gonna be the Streamlight ProTac Rail Mount HLX. This thing is great. It comes with the pressure pad switch, comes with the mount. It uses rechargeable 18650 batteries, I believe. I mean, this thing is incredibly bright. You can also get the strobe mode on it. I've been running it on this gun here for a little over a year. Love it to death and it has not failed or anything. And I just like how you can mount these right here on the corner of the M lock. And it just looks dead sexy. I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail about it because there's not a whole lot of rifle lights that I would recommend that are as affordable as this one. But all you do is slap it on, get you a Ranger band. I'll have links for those over at the parts list. That way you can keep your pressure pad on the gun without it coming off. And you can also, you know, tuck up your wiring and things like that as well. Now on my next favorite upgrade is slings. Slings are great, especially when you're at the range and you don't have anywhere to set your gun. So for slings, I have three favorites and they're all two point slings. I don't like single point slings very much. The first one is gonna be the Magpul MS1 sling. I like it because it has that quick release so you can keep it cinched up and a little extra tip for you. When you have them cinched up, if you loosen it a little bit, wrap it around the buttstock, put it around the front grip and then re-tighten it, you can store your guns just like this. And not only that, say you had it in your truck or something like that and you found yourself pulling your gun out of your truck and you had it stored like that, you can still totally shoot like this throw rounds down range until you can get behind cover and pull, you know, and take off the sling and extend the stock. 
you can still shoot it in this configuration, which is why I prefer to do it like that. The thing I don't like about the MS-1 sling is I don't like how difficult it is to pull this when you actually have it on, which brings me to my second favorite. My second favorite comes from Blue Force Gear. Um, this has been one of my longtime favorites for a while. It has a pull tab right here, so you can extend it. And when you have it on, you can also pull it and tighten it up really easily as well. And again, it's the same as the Magpul MS-1 sling and you can wrap it around and store your gun as well. Now this isn't the biggest deal in the world, but the one thing that I don't like about this is how thick the actual material of the sling is. And it's not that it's bad or anything, but if you have one of those stocks that doesn't have a QD mount, and you only have those little slots to stick sling through, this guy doesn't really fit through there very well, especially if you have to double it over. And also because of the thickness, it's just not the most flexible sling ever, which brings me to my new favorite sling. This guy right here is the tier one concealed X flatline rifle sling. It's basically identical in function to the Blue Force gear, but it's using a lot thinner of material so that you can really get this thing on and wrapped around and it doesn't get cumbersome when it's around your neck or if you have a plate carrier on and have it around. This thing is very lightweight. It also has a shoulder pad on it, which the previous two do not have. These are less than hundred bucks. I forgot the exact price of them. And they come in a few different colors. Uh, they got them in this one, which is the coyote version. You can get it to match your gun if you want to. They also have it in ranger green, woodland camo. They also have it in gray and multi-cam with ranger green. Awesome slings, love them to death. I'm actually gonna get a couple more to put on some of these other guns because for now, at least, it's my all-time favorite. I might as well rig up my favorite guns with them. Now for our plus one upgrade today, I'm gonna recommend these guys here called Magpods. These work for Gen 2, and there is one for Gen 3 P Mags. They replace your base plates of your magazines. And then, as you can see right up there, you can stand them up. It's basically for a display. However, there is a new version that came out that has a multitaskers tool in it, and the Magpod actually retains that tool. So if you're at the range, you don't have a tool with you, you can get a multi-tool to put on there. And I think that's kind of cool. I don't have that version as of right now, but I will be getting one in the very near future. But the downside to the Magpods is they don't work with my favorite magazines ever, and that's gonna be Lancer L5 magazines. A Couple of things that I don't like about the P-Mags, is you can't really see through them unless you get the Gen 3s. And also, if your rounds aren't within that small little window on the Gen 3s, then you still don't know how many rounds you got. So I like some translucent mags, and the thing that I liked about the Lancer mags the most was not only can you get them in a bunch of cool colors that are translucent, but they also have metal feed ramps on them. And the metal feed ramps make a big difference because if you've ever noticed when you buy a P-Mag, they come with these little plates that are on the top of them. And a lot of people just yank those plates off and discard them. But what those plates are meant for is if you store your magazines loaded, if you don't have that plate to put on top of it, over time, that spring tension will start to separate the feed lips at the top and your magazines can be ruined. And so I like the fact that these have metal feed lips Therefore, you don't need to keep that top cap if you're gonna keep your magazines loaded. So let me know down in the comments section which was your favorite upgrade that you do like to do to your AR-15s for less than $100. If there's something I missed, let me know that as well. But until next time, guys, I love you, and you guys stay sexy.